You know, consoles are so advanced nowadays. There was once a time, literally, in real life, when Nurse Joy would not wish you a happy birthday when you walked into the Pokemon Center. And that's no ghost story, kid. It's just the way that things used to be. You didn't set up a system clock or set the date. You just played your game and celebrated your big day without any fanfare at all. Or even a happy birthday text at midnight. Happy birthday to you! Like me. It's not just birthdays either. Christmas, Halloween, day or night, you'd be surprised how many clock-based events there actually are. Take a look at that timestamp, buddy. You're in the middle of one right now. Of course, not all clocks are built the same. There is a degree of separation between them because not every game or console for that matter is capable of knowing the player's home address and taxing you for digital games just because you moved out of Oregon. There are three main forms the in-game clock can take. System clocks, internal game clocks, and clocks tied to story progression. System clocks, as you'd expect, are based on your console's date and time. These are the most immersive clocks, since it's always going to be tied to our real world. A lot of modern games take advantage of this, although there are cases like Pokemon that used things like batteries to keep track of the time in place of a modern clock. Internal game clocks are sort of similar. There's a day and a night, but it's not based on our world, it's based on his. It's a clock that's continuously moving, but it runs while we are playing and doesn't continue to move when when we're not. Lastly, we have the event-based clock tied to story progression. Essentially, the time doesn't move until you do something that makes it move. The first thing that comes to my mind is Persona's in-game calendar. These kind of clocks give you all the time in the world to make a decision on what character you should hang out with, removed from the pressure of time limits. It's the illusion of time, and it's pretty comfortable in my opinion gives Persona 5's loading screen a more literal meaning. I think you'll be surprised by the amount of ways developers have used this tool to their advantage. One of my favorite uses of the PS2's system clock was in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. This game is already filled with details and secrets that are so hyper-specific that they definitely deserve their own video someday, but I'm gonna focus on what's definitely the most famous clock-based event from this game, and it's gotta be hands down the boss fight with the end. If you're having trouble getting past his boss fight, why learn his attack patterns or get better at the game when you can just wait for him to die of old age? When you start the encounter, save, quit, then come back after a few days you'll find him turned to bones. You have to imagine there were some dirtbag kids out there who discovered this secret organically back in the day after a long week of doing whatever it is you do when you're not playing video games all day long. Like me. Who's surprised? Animal Crossing is probably more famous for its real-world clock features than any other game we'll be covering today. For instance, each hour of the day, according to your system clock, has unique music to fit the mood. There are also special events you'll encounter at specific real-world times. Nightcrawlers have a chance to have a close encounter if you turn your television on at 3.33 in the morning. Stores have hours of operation, and your villagers even have their own sleep schedules. Certain events happen at specific times, and others occur on specific days. The turnip gal comes on Sunday mornings, and certain bugs or fish can only be caught in their respective seasons. They've been doing this stuff since the first came in the series, and I find it particularly ambitious. The original Animal Forest didn't even have the luxury of a proper system clock since it was a Nintendo 64 game. You simply set the time every time you booted up the game, that way clock-based events could still occur. The in-game events list is getting pretty lengthy. No matter which entry in the series it is, you know the holidays are getting some special treatment. Unlike Unless, of course, you're playing New Horizons, where they seem to hate teachers, fathers, and mothers for whatever reason. There were actually quite a few region-specific holidays in New Leaf. The Autumn Moon Festival has unique attributes depending on where you live. In Japan, the plaza will have a cardboard standee of a table with a dongo, while American towns have a scarecrow. Japanese towns celebrate the Girls' Day, or Dolls' Day, on March 3rd, which is basically a holiday dedicated to wishing all young women health and happiness. Can't we do that every day, guys? Of course, we have the Christmas-themed Toys Day that takes place on the 24th. Anyone opening the game during the holidays would be treated to this fun event thanks to your system clock. My favorite event, hands down, has to be the New Year's shirts you receive in Animal Crossing City Folk. On the New Year's Day, after the festivities are over, Tortimer will gift the player the titular New Year's shirt. 
shirt. But what makes this really special is that City Folk features a different New Year's shirt all the way up to 2035. You of course are not permitted to leave the video to go check, but if you really want to know, we are not even close to that date. And to the comedian viewer coming back 10 years in the future, you are not permitted to let me know that we are close to that date either. So for those true believers out there who are still on that City Folk grind, you'll be happy to know we have at least 12 more years of new content to look forward to. I went to the trouble of starting my own town so we could look at the shirts together. This shirt I think is worth turning your Wii on every January 1st for. New Horizons simply could never, because they have no interest in doing fun, cool things. Just bare minimum bland piece of shit things. Word of advice, um, you could just play Wild World, and you can also hack your 3DS, you don't have to buy it. You just, you don't have to anymore. It's free. Nintendo said it was free now. Pokemon's another really obvious one, so bear with me before I get to the really obscure stuff. Generations 2 and 3 used an internal battery to keep track of its day-night cycle. This allowed for things like specific Pokemon spawns, time-specific evolutions, and so much more. In gold and silver, you could enter the bug catching contest every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. On Monday nights, you can find a group of Clefairy dancing in Mount Moon. In Pokemon Emerald, Shoal Cave had different tide levels depending on the time of day. During low tide, you could even explore an entire cave system below the water. From gardening to daily haircuts, the Game Boy and the Game Boy Advanced games were filled to the brim with clock-paced events. Unfortunately, if your battery ever died, you'd be unable to experience most of these. Since the DS Onward had a system clock it could reference, Pokemon really started to get creative. One of the most intriguing features was discovered from looking at Diamond and Pearl's source code. I have no idea why this is the case, but if you play the game on the anniversary of a tragedy like 9-11, all Pokemon spawn rates decrease by 10% across the entire game. For some reason, this also happens on January 1st. Maybe they know something I don't, I don't know. The Gen 5 games featured seasons, so if it was fall in the real world, it would be fall in the game. There were so many unique events that were tied to this. Of course, there were the obvious visual changes, and with this came things like leaf piles in the fall, creating new pathways to areas normally inaccessible. The music also had slightly different remixes depending on the season. It was so detailed that even shops like Castilia Cones were only open on Tuesdays in the warmer seasons. Pokemon Sun and Moon had a gimmick where the in-game clock would flip depending on the version that he bought. So Sun would follow the rules of the world that we live in, and Moon would invert the time, so during the night in our world it's day there and vice versa. I definitely could go on and on and on and on about this one game series specifically, but I am going to peel us away from the Pokemon series because it is time to shine a light on some lesser known examples. I predict at least one viewer is going to think about commenting, I knew all of those, and they aren't that obscure. Lucky for both of us, I am not able to reach through the screen and grab you. In Scooby-Doo Night of 100 Frights, the hub world would feature fireworks on the 4th of July and the snow on Christmas Day. I completely forgot about this, but if it's Valentine's Day, hearts will appear every single time you pick up a Scooby snack. And if it's St. Patrick's Day, the hub world will be filled with green smoke. Ready to Rumble 2 would have its final boss become a snowman if it was Christmas Day. Dance Dance Revolution Ultra Mix 3 had a secret song called Parade of the Wooden Soldier that would unlock on Christmas Day 2005. If for whatever reason your system clock is set earlier than that, you won't be able to find the song at all, and weirdly enough, the the song is unlocked for you on any day, as long as it's after Christmas 2005. It doesn't necessarily need to be Christmas Day. Much like the previous entry, Alex Kidd is unlocked as a playable racer in Sonic All-Stars Racing Transformed if your system clock reads any time after Christmas Day 2012. The Simpsons Hit and Run has three different main menus tied to the system clock, a Christmas, Halloween, and Thanksgiving theme respectively. Battle for Bikini Bottom had this fire-breathing enemy whose flames would change color depending on the holiday. Orange for Halloween, red, white, and blue for Independence Day, purple for April Fool's Day, and green for St. Patrick's Day. Hello, quick editorial note. So, there was not even a Christmas variant for this Easter egg, or whatever you want to call it, clock-based event, and Christmas seems to be the most common when it comes to these things, and I find it funny that April Fool's Day somehow got in over Christmas. 
Christmas. Even St. Patrick's Day somehow got in over Christmas. I just find that really unique for Battle for Bikini Bottom. Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast had super early forms of DLC that allowed for holiday events tied to your system clock. They had Halloween, Christmas, New Year's, even a specific Y2K event for the turn of the millennium. Batman Arkham Knight had a side quest related to Man Bat that featured him randomly jump scaring the player when scaling buildings if you play on Halloween. How lovely. One of Halo 3's software engineers, Adrian Perez, left a birthday message for his wife, Lauren, that is only activated by clicking in both sticks while the main menu's loading. The text, Happy Birthday Lauren, will scroll across the Halo ring. Now, we've talked extensively about the system clock and calendar, but what about the internal game clock? I'll have you know I'm exercising Herculean strength by not mentioning Majora's Mask right away. In Castlevania II Simon's Quest, the ending you got was based on how many in-game days it took you to defeat Dracula. A game day was equivalent to around three minutes, and during the night, the enemies outside of towns would become much more dangerous. Yeah, I bet it is. The ending breaks down like this. 8 days or less for the good ending, between 8 and 15 for the okay ending, and 15 plus days for the FUCK YOU SIMON Belmont, I'LL KILL YOUR WHOLE FAMILY ending. In Breath of the Wild, a blood moon occurs every 7 in-game days, or every 2 hours and 48 minutes. During this event, all enemies, mini-bosses, and forgeable items will respawn. Another effect that can happen relates to Link's culinary skill. If you cook while the blood moon is in effect, you will automatically get a critical meal, which basically means you, like, cooked really good. You can also reveal a hidden shrine by standing half-naked on this pedestal during a blood moon. Final Fantasy IX has a secret weapon called the Excalibur II that's only obtainable if you reach the final dungeon at Memoria within 12 in-game hours. It's about time they put in a reward for me who is skipping the dialogue. In Fable 1, there's a bizarre mechanic where your player character ages as you play the game. You can reach up to 65 years of age, but nothing else around you seems to age with you. You can become older than your mom in this game. I suppose having your mother randomly die of old age waiting for you to save her might have been a sour note to end the game on. Suikoden 2 is a game where you have to find and recruit 108 different characters over the course of the story, if you want to get the full experience, that is. However, there's one character who has a strange mechanic related to the game clock. Clive, the second most popular character named that in JRPG history, is one of the recruitable units, and if you aren't careful, you can actually fail to complete his side quest completely. Clive is chasing someone named Elsa, and if you don't reach the town of Saja within 20 in-game hours, the trail runs cold and she just straight up escapes. Skyrim is a glitchy mess of a game that I kind of hate coming back to nowadays, but you know, credit where credit is due. There were some cool pearls of wisdom in its bones. The game had a day-night cycle, as you'd expect of an open-world Bethesda title, but unlike other games in their catalog, there was one very special feature that took advantage of its setting and clock. Vampirism was a disease you could contract by getting attacked by a vampire, feel free to pause the video and rewind. Once the initial infection starts, you have three in-game days to take a potion of cure disease. A game day lasts 72 minutes, so you have roughly three and a half real-life hours to find a cure, otherwise you'll fully transform. Once transformed, the potion will no longer have any effect, and you'll be unable to withstand the sunlight and have a weakness to fire. These weaknesses worsen the more time you go without feasting on human blood, and mortal NPCs will even attack you on site. It wasn't all bad though, because the vampirism came with some exclusive spells and abilities. They would take this one step further when the Dawnguard DLC released by making a brand new Vampire Lord class, for those players who loved this hidden feature. Dead Rising is a game about surviving a zombie outbreak inside a mall while you wait for help to arrive. You need to survive for 72 hours or seven and a half real hours of gameplay. While waiting for the rescue chopper, you could trigger dozens of different events at various times of day. The clock-based quest lines were what made the game really special. You could just not run into an important NPC and miss out completely. Utterly failing someone you could have helped was par for the course. A first playthrough is bound 
bound to be filled with missed opportunities, but players have created guides on how to do it all in one full cycle. You have to admire that kind of optimization. I would go so far as to say it's, like, really neat. Bully is one of Rockstar's GTA adjacent franchises and makes use of a pretty neat I just said that. A pretty cool day-night cycle. After all, the game revolves around a high schooler's daily life. Your school day starts at 8am. You have two classes a day and a free period between them. You can choose to cut class if you want, but if you stay out till 2am, you instantly pass out where you're standing and wake up outside your dorm at 8am to start the cycle all over again. One second of our time is equivalent to one minute in bully time. Don't worry though, if you ever get overwhelmed or caught outside during curfew, you can just play the song of time to go back to the first day! Okay, I think it's finally time to info dump you people with Zelda stuff, so why don't we start with the obvious one, Majora's sexy little mask. The game famously revolves around repeating the same three days over and over again in an attempt to stop the moon literally from crashing into the earth. Allow me to lay it bare for you all. If that sounds even remotely fun to you, then chances are you're some brain-dead idiot or an old man who won't let go of the past. Like me. Of course I'm kidding, it's my favorite game of all time. If you think otherwise, it's probably just because you're crazy and can't trust yourself to make your own decisions, allow me to make them for you. Here's how it all breaks down for those eagle-brained viewers in attendance. One hour in-game is 45 seconds for you and me. This of course means a full 24-hour day takes 18 minutes to complete. Multiply that by 3 and you have a whopping 54 minutes to get your quests done. The inverted Song of Time, or more colloquially Song of Slow Down Time, will triple the length of your days. One minute would now be 2 minutes and 15 seconds of real time, giving the player 2 hours and 42 minutes for one three-day cycle. Of course, I was forbidden to play more than one hour per day as a child, rendering this secret function utterly useless to me. Not that I would need any more time at all to try and to fail to hand a collapsed old woman the health potion she so desperately needs. Maybe they shouldn't have changed the way you hand NPCs items in Majora's Mask. This game clock is more in-depth than any other example we've covered because every single character follows their own schedule. There's something going on at just about every hour of any given day, so the world here is practically bursting at the seams with freedom of choice. On the first night of the game, a little old lady gets robbed as she's arriving in town. If the player so chooses, they can have Link intervene with a shocking display of deadly force. Link is then rewarded with the bomb mask for your effort. Though, if you'd rather not get involved, there is a separate event happening at the exact same time you could choose to do instead. It really depends on what you value more, bombs or dancing. Of course, the moral answer is to help the old woman in need, though dancing is arguably the more human answer. Who of us could blame Link for choosing exactly what we would have done if we were in his shoes? However, this is The Legend of Zelda, not The Legend of The Last of Us Part 1, ending no commentary. We can do both. The time travel aspect makes this game what it is. Without the implementation of the in-game clock, we wouldn't have this fun system to mess around with. There's even an in-game notebook to keep track of everything, it's that dense with events. Why don't we take a look at some other Zelda games before we move on to the penultimate section of the video. Wind Waker uses the GameCube's internal clock to change the time of day for the file select screen. Twilight Princess and Wind Waker both have different moon faces that change with the passage of in-game days. While on the subject of Twilight Princess, the Poe enemy can only be found during the night. Twilight Princess doesn't feature a way to manually change the time of day, at least that's what I believed before researching this topic. Ocarina of Time has the Sun's Song, Majora's Mask has the before-mentioned Song of Time, Wind Waker has the Song of Passing, and Twilight Princess has Midna. If you ever want it to be useless daytime for some reason, you need only enter any dungeon and ask Midna to warp you out. Due to some oversight, it will always be daytime when you exit in this way. Last and 
possibly least. Skyward Sword has a day-night cycle, but it's not quite like the previous entries. The only way to change the time of day is to interact with a bed, but beds only exist in Skyloft, so it's impossible for it to be nighttime on the surface, at least while you're walking around down there. Go ahead and try to jump down there, tough guy. I'll have you know it results in Nintendo instantly calling you on the phone to tell you you're a loser. And by that I mean you get bailed out by this much more capable NPC who comes to your rescue. At last, we have reached the final stop of our journey. The event-induced clock that advances as in-game events transpire. It's less of a clock and more of an in-universe passage of time. It's not going to start moving until you achieve specific in-game goals or pass certain flags. I'm sure it's not the most interesting form the clock can take, because of course time is probably going to pass in the game if they are set in a semi-realistic world, but I've cherry-picked a few pearls among the swine. Bloodborne takes place over the course of a single night, and the time passes every time you beat a main story boss in the game of defeating main story bosses. What I like about this system in particular is as time passes and the blood moon rises, the creatures most foul become visible to the player. These guys were always here, you just didn't have enough insights to comprehend them or see them, I guess. Days pass in Final Fantasy Tactics every time you complete the battle, so if you decide to grind some levels, you'll see seasons come and go while you play. There may even be some strategic merit to doing this, because the seasons can even affect your elemental magic. Mario Party Not 7 has a game mechanic unique to it that sees the board change every three turns between a day and a night version. It's pretty in-depth. The time of day changes things like traversable pathways, shop prices, and event spaces. It can even change the way the background looks on specific minigames. What goes up has a total shift of its goal depending on the time of day. You either climb a beanstalk while trying to avoid enemies on the way up, or descend the beanstalk while trying to avoid enemies on the way down. I kind of wish they had a few more minigames like this. Persona has its calendar where entire school years pass by with weekends and bank holidays included. In Persona 3, you can act accidentally obliterate your day by walking back inside after you've already walked outside. The day just instantly ends, so make sure you do anything you want to do in your dorm first before committing to going outside. You can only take a few actions during the day in these games, so you need to use your time wisely since there's a limit to in-game days. This adds to the bond you make with your friends, I think, since just like in real life you need to make time for your friends, the way I never seem to. Do. Much like Persona, Fire Emblem adopted an in-game calendar system with its finite amount of in-game days. One thing I always wished Persona would do is character birthdays like Fire Emblem Three Houses does. You can even take them on little tea dates free of charge. Even if Fire Emblem insists on using its own medieval fantasy months, there still just so happens to be 12 of them, so what was the point of that one, y'all? Lightning Returns is an extremely unique case. This game has a doomsday clock counting down to the coming apocalypse, and much like Majora's Mask, you are expected to do it all in your allotment time. Time doesn't move while you're in battle or the hub world, but if you leave your controller on without pausing long enough, the game throws you a bone by pausing on your behalf to avoid situations like this. The Doomsday Clock is constantly ticking down, but doing main story quests or several side quests will increase that time by multiple days. There are even consumable items that extend your remaining hours, making things just a bit more manageable. Quests, locations, and the like are restricted by time of day, so good time management skills are required if you're going to beat this one-of-a-kind Final Fantasy game. One in-game hour is two and a half minutes for us, if you run out of time, the apocalypse comes and you just lose the game hilariously. You have to be very careful because constantly losing battles, healing at inns, or riding the train will drain your time before you know it. So there's kind of an internal clock situation going on with event-based clock progression and regression thrown into the mix. Time is something we always seem to lack. It's more obvious to me now than it's ever been in my entire life. Unbeknownst to all of you, I actually don't have a magic ocarina, so playing all of the games that come out is becoming quite the task. Even if I haven't finished that Xenoblade DLC or practiced nearly enough Street Fighter, it'll be waiting there for me when I'm done with my real-life clock-based events. I think we could all stand to take our Wii's advice once in a while and just take a break. 
Thank you so much for watching. Mwah. If you want to see even more of me on the internet, go ahead and join the King of Giorgio Discord link in the description below. Here are some other videos you might like that I made, and I promise I'm gonna make more soon. I just need to stop playing other video games. But if I didn't do this, then I wouldn't have any good opinions about video games, so I guess it's all part of the process, isn't it? So watch one of my other videos while you wait. Skill as a sin.